Good evening. I am Carol Allman Morton, the Executive Director of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Berkshire Community College. If you'd like to learn more about programming at Ollie at BCC, you can check out our website, www.berkshireollie.org. We have a number of programs coming up this fall, so be sure to look at the Ollie at BCC calendar of events at berkshireollie.org forward slash events. And in particular, I wanted to let folks know about our next Distinguished Speaker Series lecture with Dr. Sarah R. Cohen on art and globalism in 18th century Europe. Europe, excuse me. <clears throat> That'll be Saturday, September 30th at 3 p.m. in person only at the Berkshire Museum. And I'm just gonna put the link to that in the chat. And then also I would be remiss if I didn't say that our fall semester of classes begins on September 18th. And there are still lots of great courses online and in person that have space. You can learn more and register at berkshireolly.org forward slash fall 2023. And I'm also going to put that in the chat. All right, let's get rolling. So I'd like to introduce, and hold on, I'm gonna add her up on here with me, great. I'd like to introduce Anne DeLong, a career member of the Foreign Service, currently serving as Director of the Strategic Communications and Partnerships Unit. Anne is committed to bolstering the Foreign Service by encouraging and mentoring the best and brightest from all walks of life to represent their government abroad. As a management coned officer, Anne has served as a special assistant to the Undersecretary for Management in Human Resources, General Services, the Bureau of Overseas Buildings Operations, Consular and Staff Aid positions. Before joining the Foreign Service, Anne served as the Director of the State Department's Family Liaison Office. Anne has lived overseas in Brazil, Peru, Colombia, Nigeria, El Salvador, Lithuania, Zaire, and Greece. She speaks Spanish, French, and Portuguese. And as we get started, I wanna let you know that you can put questions in the chat as we go along. And uh, Anne's gonna speak for a bit and then we'll move into a time for questions and answers. Welcome, Anne DeLong. Thank you so much, Carol. Thank you to Carol and to Judith and to everyone at Berkshire Ollie uh, for making this possible for me to speak with you tonight. I'm really thrilled and honored to be here. I spent some time in the Berkshires during COVID. And so it's an area that's near and dear to my heart um, but being able to do it by Zoom means I can reach you tonight, even though I'm not there physically, and I know a number of you aren't either. So uh, this is really terrific, and I'm looking forward to having this opportunity to chat with you and answer any questions you may have about life inside an embassy. So if you were all in a room, I'd ask you to raise your hands, but uh, you can just go ahead and maybe answer yes or no in the chat. Have any of you watched either Madam Secretary or The Diplomat? Those are both shows available on Netflix. And uh, some people think that maybe that's what it's really like to be a diplomat, but I would suggest maybe it's not quite like that. And so we'll explore some of those differences this evening. Um, Judith, if we could start with the presentation. Okay. So as I said tonight, we're gonna to talk about uh, what it's really like to work at an embassy overseas. And I wanted to start um, by asking anyone who knows where this embassy is in the picture. This is one of our embassies overseas. Um, and again, in the chat, if you know, go ahead and, well, there's somebody who knows. Yes, it's in India. This is in New Delhi. So next question, uh, has anybody, does this building look familiar to anybody? Is there another famous building that looks similar that anyone's aware of? No, the Taj Mahal doesn't look like that. Taj Mahal is a little nicer. <laughs> yes, Ed got it, the Kennedy Center in Washington, DC. The reason they look similar is because they were designed by the same architect, Edward Stone. And uh, this is one of our uh, iconic embassies around the world. I have several different pictures and we'll actually talk a little bit about them and some of the features um, of different embassies as we move forward. But let's go to the next slide and do a little history lesson first. Okay, again, in the chat, who can tell me who was the first Secretary of State? You can Google it if you don't know. <laughs> They're thinking. <laughs> Very good, Thomas Jefferson. So a lot of people say Benjamin Franklin. Um, why do they say Benjamin Franklin? 
he was our first ambassador to France, except at the time he wasn't called an ambassador. He was called a minister plenipotentiary. Um, Jefferson actually, actually succeeded Ben Franklin as then the ambassador to France or minister plenipotentiary. And then he came back and became our first secretary of state. Okay, next question. Who was the first female secretary of state? Very good, that was quick. Okay, we got that one. Albright. And then our first African-American Secretary of State. I saw somebody already put that in the chat. Yep, Colin Powell. And then finally, our first female African-American Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice. Very good, okay. So those have been some of our leaders over time. I will say that I have met three out of four. I did not meet Thomas Jefferson. I may be old, but I'm not that old. Um, but I have served under eight secretaries of state and I have met seven of them uh, in person. Next slide, please. Okay, so what does the Department of State do? The building that you see in that picture is what we call Main State or the Harry S. Truman Building or more colloquially, Foggy Bottom. Um, but that is the State Department headquarters in Washington, D.C. It was initially built uh, to be the War Department in the late 40s. Um, and by the time it was built, uh, the, the Pentagon, the Department of Defense, wasn't the Pentagon at the time, uh, was too large for the building. And so it was ceded to the Department of State and the Pentagon was built for the Department of Defense. So the mission statement uh, of the Department of State. It's to create a more secure, democratic, and prosperous world for the benefit of the American people, number one, and the international community, number two. And we will talk about that distinction and what that means in terms of our programs uh, that we do overseas as we move forward. So the Department of State, when I say, tell people I work for the Department of State, sometimes they look at me sort of cross-eyed and they'll say, which state? And I have to say, it's actually true that outside of uh, Washington, D.C., or perhaps uh, the East Coast, there are a lot of people who don't really know about the mission of the Department of State, and that's because we don't really work internally. We do have some offices around the country, principally our passport offices um, and some of our diplomatic security offices, uh, but primarily our work is done overseas. Next slide, please. And it's done at our U.S. embassies uh, in different countries around the world. So as we noted, the mission statement of the Department of State is to uh, promote American interests and protect Americans overseas. And our embassies have effectively the same mission statement. It's to protect Americans overseas and to advance US interests worldwide. I'd like to take a minute to talk about some of the pictures on this slide as well. Um, on the right, does anybody know where that embassy might be. Again, go ahead and feel free to put it in the chat. Cutter, very good. Oh, that was great. Um, so that is in Doha, Cutter, And normally that's not sort of one of our more high profile posts until the withdrawal from Afghanistan, in which case it became our primary um, landing point. We called it a lily pad actually for everyone coming out of Afghanistan so that they could be uh, processed. Um, some had to be vaccinated. Uh, again, this was during COVID and then there was also a measles outbreak um, and there was a lot of processing, but we weren't gonna take the time to do that uh, as we were evacuating Afghanistan. And so we flew everyone to Qatar. They were incredibly helpful to us during that period. Um, and it became the hub uh, for that operation. That is one of our more traditional embassies, um, as you can see. And what about our embassy on the left? Does anybody know where that is? Very good, the UK, that's in London. And that is one of our newer embassies. Uh, time keeps marching on, so I'm not exactly sure how old it is now, but somewhere about uh, 10 to 12 years old since it opened. And there's some really unique and interesting things about this uh, um, building. So one of the primary concerns when we're building an embassy overseas is security. 
uh, on the one hand, we want to be open for people to come in. We have Americans who come in who have uh, business with the embassy, whether they're renewing a passport or getting a consular report of birth abroad, um, any of a number of other types of activities. We also have people from the host country who are coming to get a visa to travel to the United States. And so we have to have it open to the public uh, in some sense. And on the other hand, we need to make sure that everyone who works there, Americans and both uh, host country nationals alike, are safe. Our embassies have been targets overseas in the past. Um, you may remember the bombings 25 years ago now in Tanzania uh, and in Kenya, um, where there was tremendous loss of life, uh, just horrific bombings. Um, and so many of our embassies since then have had a very significant focus on the security. At the same time, uh, we don't want our walls to keep going higher. We don't want them to keep going thicker. We don't want to have bars everywhere. Uh, we do have some embassies that kind of look like bunkers. Um, but we are trying to both showcase American culture, uh, architecture and through that part of our culture, uh, but also to be more open as we deal with the rest of the world. So there are some unique security features that were built into this embassy in London. Uh, and if you look at the picture and notice that there's a water feature, does anybody know what that is around the base of the embassy? Any guesses? Yes, very good. This was actually designed as a modern day moat. And that is both a water feature, which is always lovely to have in your yard, um, but it is a security feature. And so uh, that was designed into the building. You also see the exterior facade of the building um, that was put on to make it look nice. And those are actually panels that uh, will shift with the wind. Um, some of them are solar panels, so we have solar energy. A lot of our embassies now are what we call lead gold at a minimum, and some are even lead platinum. Um, which means that they are uh, built sustainably and to meet certain environmental criteria. Next slide, please. Okay, so where do we have our embassies? Um, on this slide, it, it's small, but if you've got it on your computer screen, you can maybe see little black dots all over. And everywhere that there's a black dot, we either have an embassy, a consulate, an embassy branch office, an American presence post, or some U.S. presence overseas. And embassies are always in the capital city. Consulates may be in other cities uh, in a country. We have uh, 190 embassies around the world. We have embassies and consulates in 275 um, different uh, cities. And there are three countries where we don't have any embassies or we don't have an embassy. Does anybody know which countries uh, we do not have embassies in? North Korea, a lot of people got that one, very good. What are the other two? Mm, we actually have an embassy in uh, Cuba and also we have what's called an American interest post in um, uh, Taiwan, Iran. Yes, we do not have an embassy in Iran at the moment. And there's one more, which I'm not sure anybody got. I haven't seen it flash up here yet. Afghanistan is closed at the moment, but we do have an embassy there. Uh, the one where we don't is in Bhutan. So that's the other place that we don't have an embassy. Not that we don't have good relations with them. We actually do. Um, but it's such a small country that we don't have an embassy there. Next slide, please. Okay, so now, how many of you are current U.S. passport holders? Yes, 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 yes. Good, lots of people. And what percent of Americans do you think hold a passport at the moment? Interesting, we've got quite a range of percentages, everywhere from 5% to 75%. So this is something I'd find just fascinating. In 1990, only 
of American citizens were passport holders. Think about that. That was only 30 years ago. Now it's not quite 50%. So in just a generation, we've gone from 4% to almost 50% of Americans who hold passports and are using them to travel all around the world. And passports, of course, are issued by the Department of State. This is another one that not everybody's aware of. It's kind of funny sometimes because uh, if you ask people who, again, don't live in a major city or um, it's the first time they're getting their passport and you ask who issues a passport, they may say the post office because that's where they go to get it. Uh, they go and get their picture taken there, put their application in an envelope, send it off, and the passport comes back again through the post office. But no, they do get processed by the Department of State. And we have uh, two very large passport processing centers, one in uh, Kentucky and the other one in New Hampshire. Next slide. Okay, so let's look at the organization of an embassy overseas. And embassies are all uh, organized structurally more or less the same way. There are a couple of reasons for that. Um, number one, since we have our diplomats who rotate from embassy to embassy around the world. Um, we kind of have to slot them in and out of the same types of positions in different embassies. Uh, and also for anybody who's coming to do business with the embassy, we want them to know which section or which office they need to deal with um, depending on what their issue is. But one thing is true of all embassies around the world is they are led by an ambassador or chief of mission. This person is uh, a presidential appointee. They're nominated by the president. They serve uh, as the president's representative overseas. They do have to be confirmed by the Senate. And there are two types of ambassadors, broadly speaking. There are lots of types of ambassadors, but we have what are called career ambassadors and political ambassadors. And you usually hear a lot about this when we have a change of administration, when there's a, a presidential election because there's always a lot of debate as to what percentage of our ambassadors should be political appointees and what percent should be career diplomats. Um, and this is something that uh, comes up uh, a lot, uh, occasionally in the, the actual presidential campaigns. Um, the US and I believe Israel is the only other country that actually has political ambassadors. Uh, the vast majority of countries around the world only have career diplomats as ambassadors. And so some people think, well, we should have more career diplomats. They should understand the State Department, how government works, et cetera. Um, there's kind of this misconception that a political appointee can just pick up the phone and call the president whenever they want to. Uh, I actually say, will say that in the former administration, that did happen once or twice. But generally speaking, that's not the protocol. The protocol is that the ambassador, if they have an issue, they would call back to Washington, perhaps speak to the Secretary of State, um, and even then probably to one of the deputy secretaries or undersecretaries first uh, to address whatever the issue is. Political appointees are generally uh, given ambassadorships based on a significant contribution to the president's campaign. And uh, there's also oftentimes um, uh, some snarky reporting, shall we say, uh, in the media about how much you have to pay or donate to the campaign in order to be um, nominated or given an ambassadorship. Anyway, the role of the U.S. ambassador is generally outward facing. So the ambassador is the person who will uh, be the face of the U.S. government, who will interact with our counterparts on the ground. And the ambassador is supported by if you could click please, Judith, the deputy chief of mission. The deputy chief of mission is always a career appointee, a uh, career diplomat, sorry. Um, and uh, they do not have to be confirmed um, by the president. They come up through the ranks of the Department of State, typically have at least 20 uh, plus years of experience working at different embassies, different sizes, different geographic locations and different positions. So they have a very good understanding of how an embassy is run overseas. And they focus internally on the management of the embassy. Obviously, if uh, an ambassador is out of the country or if for some reason the ambassadorial position is vacant, which happens when we're waiting for the Senate to confirm people, for example, 
or again, when there's a change of administration and uh, the ambassadors um, submit their resignation letters and the political ones all leave post, there will be a period of time when the deputy chief of mission will be the acting ambassador or what we call the charge. Um, if we can click again, please. Let's go ahead and click a couple of times. And we, one more, and let's stop there for a moment, thanks. So under uh, the deputy chief of mission and the ambassador, we have five different and distinct sections within the embassy. When you join the State Department, you have to pick which of these sections or areas you'll work in for your career in the Department of State. And so we call these tracks or cones. The consular cone has two primary functions, and they are really the ones who are carrying out the mission of the Department of State, or the first part of that mission at least, which is to protect Americans overseas. So a consular section has two parts. One is what we call American Citizen Services. So if you lose your passport overseas, or if you're an American who gives birth overseas and you need your child to get a US birth certificate, if there's a death of an American overseas, um, if uh, there's a missing person overseas, if uh, an American is either involved in or the victim of a crime overseas, it's the American Citizen Services section um, that will be addressing those issues. The other side of the consular operation is our visa operations. And we have many different types of visas that we uh, can issue to um, foreigners who wanna to come to the United States. The most prevalent and most popular is what we call a B1, B2 visa, otherwise known as a tourist visa, for people to come and visit, uh, to tour around the country, to take their holidays, or for business meetings and conferences, negotiations and that kind of thing. In addition, we have student visas. We have special visas for the media. Um, and we also have immigrant visas. So if there's a family member uh, who would like to petition um, or someone in the US who would like to petition for their fam family member to come to the US, they would come on an immigrant visa. The same is true if uh, an American adopts, for example, um, a child overseas, or if someone uh, gets married uh, to someone overseas, they can come on a fiancé visa or come on an immigrant visa if the marriage took place outside of the U.S. Okay, we're going to move across top to the political section. This is the one that people think about when they think about diplomats. And, and this is the one that you see um, portrayed in, in the various movies and films uh, and TV series, when you look at diplomats, most often they are portraying the political appoint, um, uh, officers. So political officers interact with their counterparts um, and they will do so on all kinds of political issues, whether it's upcoming elections, um, it's different policies that we wanna put in place. If there's some kind of um, negotiation, if it's uh, how, different countries will vote on issues in the United Nations. Um, and so they typically are working very closely with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in their country and uh, are the ones that go out and about um, to do a lot of networking with diplomats from other foreign missions who are in that country as well. Um, again, going across the top, the other is the economic officers. They are very similar to the political officers, but they address anything that would fall into the economic realm. And that runs the gamut. So it includes our environment, science, technology, and health, uh, which includes climate change issues. It includes technology issues. It includes internet. It includes our blue skies agreements for aviation. Um, and obviously uh, kind of bread and butter economic issues um, in terms of how the macro economy is doing, also facilitating uh, trade groups and imports and exports uh, to and from the United States. Going back to the bottom left, we have the public diplomacy branch and they have uh, two functions as well. The first um, is kind of a reporting function. So they monitor all of the media and they also are the ones who are putting out messages from the ambassador. Uh, about issues uh, that are taking place or, or 
promoting US policy overseas. The other side of the house um, is what we call the cultural affairs officers. And I always say that they have the best job in the mission. So they're the ones who get to organize uh, all of the visits. Um, and, and these are what we call the soft diplomacy. They will bring athletes and artists and uh, astronauts, um, musicians, uh, performers, and different uh, people from the United States to showcase American culture overseas. They also coordinate our Fulbright program, our student exchange programs, and they also bring groups of leaders, up and coming leaders from that country to the US uh, for visits to go around the US um, to meet with different counterparts and to get a taste of American culture. And then finally, we have uh, the management section. And uh, as Carol mentioned at the beginning, I am a management cone officer. And we are the ones who really work internally to the mission. Our job is to ensure that the platform is in place so that everybody else can do their job. And that includes uh, ensuring that people have housing and transportation and uh, internet connections and radio communications, um, computers. We do the hiring, we do the contracting. Uh, we have a medical unit at most posts as well that comes under the management office. So the whole range of, of support activities um, fall into the uh, management cone. I sometimes tell people that, you know, some of our embassies overseas, frankly, are, are larger than small towns in the United States. And if you think about all of the things that a, a small town might have, um, we have to provide the same overseas. And particularly in some places where our embassies really have to be self-contained. Uh, Sudan comes to mind as an example, um, where there's just no infrastructure or insufficient infrastructure in the country. And so we have to build and maintain our own including wastewater treatment plants, including electricity generation, including all kinds of um, infrastructure uh, to support the embassy. Go ahead and click on the next two, please, Carol. And I think I saw a question in the chat. Um, is the Ukrainian ambassador a political appointee? That's a good question. I am not sure. I would have to look that up. And what percentage of each cone ultimately becomes ambassadorial rank? The majority of ambassadors are from the political cones. There's no question about that. Um, some PD, some economic, uh, but largely political. Some consular become um, ambassadors and very few management become ambassadors, but it does happen. Okay, so two others I just wanna mention, the regional security office. I mentioned earlier um, and uh, that security obviously is a primary focus uh, at our embassies overseas. And so we do have a regional security office that operates uh, inside each of our missions to ensure that both the people and the structure uh, are safe. And then we also have other agencies um, that operate out of our embassies overseas. Next slide. So I wanna go through quickly just a couple of these other agencies um, and what they do. Some will be familiar to you uh, and hopefully their, their operations will be fairly obvious. Um, and some may not, so we'll see. Uh, the CDC, I think everybody is now very familiar with what CDC does, uh, both domestically, and they do something very similar overseas, which means that they operate out of our embassies. Uh, oftentimes they are embedded with the Ministry of Health in whatever country. Um, and their job is to kind of monitor the health conditions for any outbreaks, possible epidemics, um, uh, infectious diseases, uh, things that might be brought back to the US. They're not at every embassy, but they are at some of our embassies uh, overseas. The Department of Defense, we have all three branches, typically at most embassies, including obviously the Air Force, the Army, the Navy, and the Marines, who serve a very important uh, role overseas. They guard our facilities. So we will have a Marine Security Guard contingent at uh, all of our embassies overseas and some of our consulates. Um, and their job really is to protect the property and the classified information in that property. The Department of Commerce works very closely with uh, our economic sections and their role is just that. It's in trade and they are promoting trade uh, and, and trade missions back and forth um, 
between the United States and whatever country uh, to promote imports and exports overseas. Going down to the bottom left, we have uh, the Department of Justice. And we have several parts of the Department of Justice that operate at our missions overseas. The FBI is at some of our missions. If they're not there, they are brought in if there's ever a crime against an American. That's their primary role overseas is to investigate those crimes. We also, in some posts, have the Drug Enforcement Agency, and I'll talk a little bit more about them in a few minutes. Go ahead and advance to the next slide, please. And I saw a question come up in the chat. What percentage of the embassy speaks the language of the nation to which they are assigned? Uh, the majority, certainly. Um, of the Americans, the political, economic, public diplomacy, and consular sections are all uh, typically required to speak that language because they use it in their day-to-day -day operations. Our local staff, of course, all speak uh, the local language and they have to speak also English. It's the management officers and people in the management cone who probably get less language training than some of the other positions. Typically the management officer um, themselves uh, is, um, it would have to have uh, language ability, um, but some of the others, maybe the HR officer, uh, wouldn't necessarily because they would not be interacting with counterparts outside of the mission. Their work is really internal to the mission. And so they may or may not get language training. I saw a question about CIA. They do operate out of our missions overseas. Um, I did not highlight them specifically, but yes, uh, they are oftentimes uh, at our missions as well. So just going through a few others, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, um, they operate out of some of our missions. The Peace Corps overseas, they do not operate out of our missions. They are at post sometimes, uh, but they are very separate and they were set up that way um, very specifically when the Peace Corps started in 1961 to ensure that there wouldn't be any uh, communication or any opportunity to um, confuse or conflate the activities of Peace Corps with, for example, the CIA at post. And so they really operate quite separately. Um, although obviously in any kind of a, an emergency situation, we look out for them as well uh, overseas. USAID operates in most of our um, uh, developing countries um, or emerging markets uh, and uh, provide foreign assistance um, particularly after natural disasters. And then they also have many programs uh, to help support and develop either agriculture, health programs, uh, economic development, um, education, et cetera. So do, they do a range of programs uh, overseas. The Department of Treasury is at some of our missions as well. And they usually are embedded with the Ministry of Finance. So they will be monitoring um, kind of the the financial markets in that country, um, fiscal policy, et cetera. We wanna make sure that the economies of other countries remain stable because if they become destabilized, that can impact our economy as well. And then we also have the USDA uh, and they do a couple of things. They obviously promote agricultural trade between the United States and the host country. Uh, they also, uh, through their APHIS program, do inspections of agricultural products that are coming into the United States. So I left uh, the Secret Service for last um, because I wanted to ask people <clears throat> uh, what they think the Secret Service does overseas. Go ahead and put it in the chat. Does anybody know? Let's what do they do in the US? Let's start with that. What does the Secret Service do? Okay, in the US, they protect the president. What do they do when they're embedded overseas if the president never shows up? Very good, whoever said currency protection. The actual initial mission of the Secret Service was to counteract counterfeit currency. And so that is what they do when they are embedded at a mission overseas. Um, the, when the president comes to visit and, and the president does travel to different posts around the world, uh, 
he has his own secret service who will come with him from Washington. But those who are embedded at post are uh, working um, to counteract counterfeit currency. And particularly in countries where we have the drug trade going, this is often um, kind of a collateral industry uh, that operates on the side. I'm going to check the chat quickly because I thought I saw a couple of questions pop up. Um, on my side, they sort of pop up and disappear for very quickly. Oh, I, I can read them for you, Anne. One was, okay. um, does the State Department provide language training for people newly assigned to an overseas embassy? Yes, and I have a whole slide on language, so we'll talk about that further at that point. Yep. Great. And then the other question was, before uh, getting a position, regardless of level, how long is the training program? Very good question. Um, so we have what's what used to be called the A100 course. Now it's called the orientation course. Uh, and that lasts for six weeks. So everybody comes to Washington. We have a six week course that they all go through together in cohorts or in groups. Um, and then, then everybody uh, graduates and they go through what's called flag day, which is when they are told which post they will be serving at. And so they get a little flag from that post. Um, and then depending on the post and the position, there may be additional training that they do before they actually go uh, to that country. So they may go through consular training if they're going to serve a consular tour. They may go um, for language training if they need the language. And they may go for some other kind of uh, substantive training if they're going to do an economic position or a political position or whatever. And how is that determined? Uh, we have a bidding process, but the first two tours are what we call directed assignments. So basically, there's just a list of all of the open and available positions when people come in through these cohorts. Um, and at the beginning of the, the orientation session, that list will be uh, provided to everybody. And after two weeks or so, uh, all of the, the entrants who've just joined will be asked to uh, rank order the posts where they want to go. And then it's, it's a matching process. So if you're lucky, you get one of your top five. If you're really lucky, you may get your first or second choice. Um, if you're not so lucky, maybe you get choice number 10. Uh, and hopefully you get something that's on your list. Um, how frequently are State Department employees move to different posts? The first two tours are two years each. And then after that, a standard tour is three years at each post. Some of our hardship posts may be a little bit shorter, but uh, that's the, the general standard. Okay, next slide, please. Well, here we go. Is it easier or hard to find qualified employees? We have many more people applying than we select, so I guess that um, we can find them. Uh, in the past, we had up to 20,000 people a year applying for about 800 slots. Um, this past year, uh, we've brought in the most uh, that we've ever brought in, and that was, I think, 923 was the number I heard, people. Um, because we've had to build back up a little bit uh, after the the previous administration. Um, but that's that's kind of the range. So if you want to be a Foreign Service officer, you must be a US citizen. You may also hold another citizenship. We do have many officers who are dual nationals who maybe either were born in another country. That happens sometimes. Um, more likely their parents hold citizenship over another, from another country. And so they also have that derivative citizenship. Uh, but they must also be a U.S. citizen. You have to be between the ages of 21 and 60. Um, we have what's called an upper out system. And so we have mandatory retirement at age 65. Uh, you have up to five years in order to get tenured. And so that's why age 60 is the oldest that you can join. You must be what we call worldwide available. And that is that you are willing to serve at any post overseas. I talked a little bit about the matching process. Um, that's how we do all of our bidding, even after our first two selected assignments. Um, we get into a bidding process where, again, we get a list of all of the open positions, and we can then reach out, ask about the responsibilities of a particular position, ask about um, conditions at post for family members, whether there's employment for the spouse, what the schools are like, et cetera. 
and then we put together our list of um, places that we would like to go. Uh, the posts at the same time, after we've been lobbying with them, we'll put their list together of people they would like to see at post and you hope that you match up. Uh, if you don't match on the first go round and about um, two thirds get matched in the first round, um, then we it is an ongoing process until you get assigned. So two things that generally surprise people when we talk about uh, the requirements is that there are no explicit educational requirements. You're not required to have a bachelor's degree or a master's or anything else. You just have to pass the foreign service officer test. Um, and there are people who've taken it multiple times and have not passed. Uh, but that um, historically was kind of the bar that you had to meet. And then once you pass that, you would go through something called the Foreign Service Officer Assessment, which is a day-long um, assessment, including a one-on-one -on -one interview, including an inbox exercise, including a group exercise, including a variety of sort of situational things. Um, and if you pass all of that, then you can join. So it doesn't really matter where you went to school or what degree you have. Uh, I mentioned I'm a management cone officer, but my bachelor's is in chemistry and I have a master's in environmental science. I also later got an MBA because I'm a management cone officer and it seemed a little weird just to have a bachelor's in chemistry and a master's in environmental science to do that. Um, the other thing that people find very surprising is that there's no foreign language requirement. We did talk about languages a little bit, uh, but we don't uh, require anybody to have a language before they join. And the reason for that is we really don't have a huge expectation that people will speak, for example, Urdu or Croatian or Farsi um, or Hausa. And if we need you to speak that language, we will train you in that language. We have what we call the Foreign Service Institute in Arlington, Virginia, which is just across the river um, from the main state building. And it's basically a small university campus. And uh, we do a lot of training there. We do all of our training there, but a large part of it is language training. So I think there were a couple more questions that popped up in the chat. Um, maybe we'll pause for a minute and see what those are. Sure, so one of the training questions was, do folks get safety training when they're being posted? Absolutely, uh, as I mentioned, safety and security are foremost uh, in everybody's mind when they go overseas. And so uh, we have several different uh, safety courses that people take before they can go. And are, are there married couples who move together? Yeah, that's a very good question. We have what are called tandem couples, um, and they can be either a, a state tandem, meaning both work for the Department of State. We even have what are called interagency tandems, where one might work for the Department of State and the other one works for USAID or the Department of Commerce um, or USDA. They don't always move together. Uh, we try and they try to stay together as much as possible. But as they both move up in their careers, um, there are nepotism issues that may come into consideration. And then uh, these other agencies are not at all posts. Um, some posts just have State Department of Defense and maybe two or three other agencies. Some like London, I think there are 43 different agencies represented in London. Um, so a lot of it depends on where you're going, what the position is. And so sometimes people will do separated assignments. And uh, two sort of connected questions. Um, one about um, what's the psychological vetting like and, and to what, you know, with what goals? And then are applicants polygraphed? Okay, um, both very good questions. So after you pass the Foreign Service Officer Test and the Foreign Service Officer Assessment, uh, if you get through all that, then you go on what's called a register. Um, which is basically a list of everybody who's passed. And then you stay on that register until you get called up. But before you get called up, there are three clearances that you have to get. You have to get a medical clearance, because as I mentioned, you have to be worldwide available. And so you have to be able to go to places where the medical care is not the same standard as it is in the US. Uh, you have to get a security clearance. You wanna make sure we're not hiring felons or uh, people who have other security um, issues. And then you also have to get what's called a suitability clearance. And that probably speaks most to the question about psychological vetting, or whatever. Um, we really wanna make sure that people can handle moving from country to country around the world, <clears throat> that they can handle uh, living in different cultures, different environments, 
um, where a different language is spoken, where it may be very foreign in a lot of different ways, um, and it may be very isolated, or it may be very high stress, or it may be in a war zone. And so uh, people are vetted for their ability to adapt and be flexible and to thrive um, and be productive in all those different kinds of environments. Great. Thank okay. You. Um, there was a couple more. Do you want me to hold them? Sure. No, go ahead. Okay. Um, another question. Are are you still actively courting college language majors? We will actively court anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then, uh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you know, the, the phrase used to be that we hired the best and the brightest. Um, <clears throat> and then some people who were not part of the State Department took exception to that uh, characterization. Um, but we have a program called Diplomats in Residence, and there are currently 17 who are stationed around the country. They're embedded in a particular university, but they have responsibility for a, a geographic area. Um, and they do a lot of outreach and recruiting, providing information to potential applicants, um, helping them uh, familiarize themselves with the process uh, of um, uh, the application process um, and trying to dispel a lot of the myths and, and answer a lot of people's questions about what is it really like uh, to work at an NBC overseas. Mm. And um, another question uh, sort of connected to that recruitment are, are, and as people are being placed, are there, you know, some identities that people might hold might be more or less challenging in different parts of the world um, for those folks to like, you know, be safe in those places? Is that taken into account as well as, as people are placed or is it less yeah. on the radar? Um, no, absolutely. It's actually something that the department is is very focused on, uh, particularly in this in this time period um, under this administration. Uh, LGBTQ applicants are not excluded in any way, shape, or form. Um, we have quite a few who work uh, with the department. I will say that some countries are less welcoming, certainly, of LGBTQ. Um, uh, diplomats. Um, it, the culture is less welcoming. Uh, the country may have laws against uh, homosexuality, et cetera. Um, in some cases, they will provide accreditation for uh, the employee's same-sex spouse, and in other countries, they won't. And so that becomes an issue. Um, the Foreign Service Officer employees uh, are, are able to access information about um, the laws in each country. Um, we we do an annual survey at each post so that we can provide uh, accurate and up-to-date information about the situation, and they can use that as part of their bidding criteria. In the mm -hmm. same way that people use schools for their kids as part of their bidding criteria, sometimes people use housing. as <laughs> They want a nice house, so they don't want to go someplace where they can't get a nice house. Um, some people, it's just the country. It's Some it's the language, some it's the job. Everybody has their own kind of criteria uh, for what's most important for them at different points in time as they're bidding on their different assignments. Great. Okay. Thanks. Uh, you should keep rolling. Keep rolling. Okay. And I'll, I'll, I'll bank some of these and we'll we'll come back to them. That sounds great. Let's move on to the next slide then. Okay. Um, all right. I did want to tell some stories because this is always fun. Uh, and these are all um, personal stories, things that I was uh, involved in. Uh, one thing I will say is that every Foreign Service officer's career is completely different, um, even though we have the same job ostensibly. Um, and so uh, let's just move forward. I'll, I'll tell you a couple consular stories. My kids always told me that the consular stories were the best. Uh, and then some of the management stories. So next slide, please. And I'll start by saying that um, everyone has to serve at least one consular tour and sometimes two. I ended up serving two, one in Nigeria. That was my first tour. And then my second tour was in Colombia and that was also a consular tour. Uh, but the best stories came from Nigeria for sure. 
So the picture on the left is what a typical consular waiting room will look like. There are a bunch of chairs, and then you can see the individual windows. And so when a person's name or number is called, they'll step up to the window. They'll speak to a consular officer. We do interview everyone um, for their initial visas. In some countries, we allow them to renew without uh, a separate interview. It depends on the country. It depends on reci reciprocity. It depends on a lot of things. Um, but anyway, I was in Nigeria, and... Uh, there was a gentleman who came to my window who was not Nigerian. He was actually from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And he told me that he wanted to go uh, to the United States to sell diamonds. And so he had a piece of paper that was folded up and he wanted to put under the, the consular window, there's an opening so that you can pass papers back and forth um, if need be. And he wanted to show me his diamonds uh, to prove to me that he was who he said he was and and that he was going to go to the U.S. and um, sell these. Uh, he had never traveled to the U.S. before. Um, he was in a third country. He was not in Democratic Republic of the Congo getting his, his visa. And so this raised a lot of questions. So when we're on the consular line and have a visa applicant in front of us, there are a couple of things that we are, are trying to assess or determine in that interview. First of all, we want to know, there are three questions basically that we ask or need to answer. The first is, are they who they say they are? We need to confirm their identity. The second is, um, are they going for the purpose uh, as stated? So if they say they're going to Disneyland, are they going to Disneyland or are they going someplace else? Um, and the third is, are they going to come back? So there are lots of ways that people can uh, present themselves. Uh, there are lots of, of things that we look for to kind of assess whether we can answer these questions um, affirmatively and then issue them a visa. So uh, at the time um, when I was working in Abuja, we had a number of what we called overstays, which means people would get a visa, go to the U.S., but then didn't come back. And so uh, we did. We had a high refusal rate compared to some other posts. Um, and we spent more time on our interviews and we asked a lot of questions. And so the first thing I had to ask this gentleman um, was where he had sold his diamonds previously and, you know, why suddenly he had to go to New York to sell his diamonds as opposed to whatever he'd been doing over some period of time, as he explained to, himself, to me that he had been a diamond dealer for a while. And it turned out in the past he had sold them to um, uh, a middleman who had taken them to Singapore, sold them for a much higher price. And when uh, the... Um, Congolese applicant uh, figured out kind of the difference. He thought, well, okay, he wanted to cut out the middleman and go himself. Um, so first I asked him if he had a Kimberly certificate. And I don't know if people are familiar with this or not. This is a, a treaty that was put together. If you ever saw the movie Blood Diamonds, um, it basically uh, says that you can trace the origins of this diamond and that you know that the proceeds from this um, were not used to uh, support an overthrow of the government of the country in which it was mined. It's a little bit complicated, but anyway, um, we use these certificates to uh, try to put some uh, uh, controls on the diamond trade. Um, he did not have one. And so uh, when you are in interviewing someone uh, for a visa, there are basically three answers you can give them. And you give them to them at the moment, in at the end of the interview. You make the decision and the person is notified immediately that either, yes, they received the visa, no, they're not getting their visa, or um, we need more information to make a determination. And so we give them a, a, a letter saying, you know, please gather the additional information and come back and we'll re-interview you at that time. So I gave him what's called a 214B letter, uh, which says that he could get um, additional information and come back. So about a month or two later, he came back and he had his Kimberly certificate. And it's one that you can, you know, look up and verify online, et cetera. So I did all of that. And I said, okay. <clears throat> and he had traveled previously, just not to the United States. So I said, I'm going to give you a two week visa and I'm going to annotate it heavily, uh, which means when you arrive in the United States, um, you will go into what's called secondary questioning. The 
the customs and immigration officer will pull you aside and he will go through all of your documents, et cetera, as well. Um, and if you demonstrate to me that you are going for the purpose for which you state and that you are going to return, then you can come back again and I'll give you a full validity visa. And so several months later, he actually came back and he had done exactly as he said. Uh, so he then got a full validity visa, which meant at the time, it was for a duration of two years, but he could come and go uh, to the United States multiple times during that time period. Um, one thing I do wanna clarify, so a visa does not get you into the United States. A visa only gets you to the door. And it's the Department of State that issues the visa. The people who let you in are from uh, the Department of Homeland Security, USCIS, Customs and Immigration Services. And they're the ones when you arrive from an international flight and you have to go through immigration, they're the ones who are asking you the questions, again, confirming your identity, what you're doing in the US, how long you're planning to stay. And that's what they ask people those same questions. If it matches what they told the consular officer, then generally they're allowed to go in. Uh, if it doesn't, that's when they get pulled into what we call secondary questioning. And the DHS can see the notes that we have put in when we do the consular interview so they can match those. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so this was another situation in Nigeria. This is a stock photo that I got off the internet, <clears throat> but it illustrates uh, uh, the next story. Um, polygamy is legal in Nigeria, um, particularly in the northern part of the country, uh, which is Muslim. You will find many uh, families um, where it's a husband with multiple wives. And so I had somebody show up at my window and there were 24 people traveling in this family group. Uh, and it was a husband, his four wives and all of his various children. And so uh, at the time we had the Defense of Marriage Act which said uh, marriage in the United States is uh, between one woman and one man. So we do not recognize polygamy here. Um, and we could only consider the first wife as his actual wife. We don't consider wives two, three, and four as wives. Now that doesn't mean they couldn't travel um, because oftentimes if you have a family where there's one breadwinner, for, for example, let's just say that it's the father um, and uh, the family wants to travel together, we're asking then the father uh, about his business, his income, his ability to pay for everybody, whether he's coming back, uh, et cetera. And we assume that the family members will also, because they're part of the same family. So um, the they basically have what we call derivative status. So they would get a visa based on um, the, the successful uh, application of the primary breadwinner in that situation. So I asked the, the man to come up with his first wife and children from that wife. They had all traveled before. He was a very successful businessman uh, in the Northern part of Nigeria. Um, and so they all qualified for a visa, no problem. Second wife came up. Um, she didn't qualify as a wife because we don't consider her one, but because she was part of the family and had traveled again and her children had as well, and they were all dependent on the father. Um, they all got visas as well. So this went down until we got to wife number four, um, whom he had married very recently in the last several months before they came in for the interview. And she was much younger. I think she was 19. Uh, and he had no children with her yet. Um, and I didn't know if she was actually a wife or maybe she was the niece of one of the other wives or some other extended family member. Um, or a nanny to some of the children, et cetera. But it was very clear to me that she was an integral part of the family, that she was totally dependent upon that family. And it was clear that she was not going to be separated from that family. And so I went ahead and issued her a visa as well. Next slide. Okay. Um, I wanna talk briefly about the, the pandemic evacuation. Um, and this also had to do with consular, because remember, again, the mission of uh, the State Department and our embassies overseas is to protect Americans around the world. And it's the consular section that does that, American Citizen Services. And so they all went to into action um, when uh, the pandemic broke out. 
in Wuhan, China three years ago, three and a half years now. So uh, these pictures actually are from uh, the, the top left uh, is the airport in Wuhan, where we were evacuating um, uh, the members of, of our consulate there. The embassy was in Beijing, we took people out of the consulate. Um, the top right is actually in Myanmar, and this is the processing that people uh, go through before they get on the flight um, to evacuate. There are two things that we're looking for. Number one, we have to uh, make sure they're American citizens. Every country, of course, was evacuating their own citizens. Sometimes we work with other countries to either fill planes or, or that kind of thing. Um, but during the pandemic, it was pretty much every country was evacuating their own citizens and not others. So they have to show that their US passport, demonstrate that they're an American citizen. And the other thing they have to do is sign um, a repayment agreement. We will get you out of Dodge if uh, there's uh, a situation, whether it's a pandemic, a natural disaster, terrorism, et cetera, um, but we charge you for the flight. So uh, you have to repay um, and it's typically the equivalent of a commercial air ticket. Uh, and if you don't, then your passport doesn't get renewed. But anyway, um, so that's the processing that's happening on the top right. And then at the bottom, uh, this is uh, that first plane again coming out of Wuhan. And you can see everybody coming off. I mean, they've got the uh, surgical paper masks and the people who are greeting them. This is in the US um, at Marsh Air Force Base in Southern, Southern California. Of course, are in complete hazmat suits with uh, air supply and are spraying them down with disinfectant. So this was their welcome home um, at the very beginning of COVID. They then spent two weeks in quarantine at Fort Marsh before they were allowed to uh, go further into the US, either to Washington, um, if they were in the police and coming to the main state to work or to their homes uh, in other places. Next slide. Okay. So those were some of the consular stories. Now just uh, briefly, I'll go into two um, uh, kind of management stories or things that happen. Top left, you see Air Force One. Uh, that was when President Obama came to Lima, Peru. That was his last international trip as president. Uh, you can see the red carpet being rolled out um, and the military band members waiting for his arrival. And then on the bottom left, you can see as he comes off the plane uh, and is greeted with military honors. On the top right, that was uh, then Secretary of State John uh, Kerry, who came uh, also to Lima to the um, COP22, I believe it was, Conference of the Parties for the UN Climate Agreement. Um, and there's a funny story with this one. So if you can see on the right side of that picture, there is a teleprompter. And you've probably seen these in State of the Union addresses and occasionally, you know, the camera will pan across and you'll get to see it. Um, basically, it's a, a piece of glass. It's clear when you look through it, but the person looking on the other side can see the text as it gets uh, scrolled along. And that's how they can look out at the audience and read their speech um, when they're giving it. And so uh, when Secretary Kerry came to Lima, they asked if we had one of these teleprompters. And we did not uh, at the embassy. And we asked around within the government um, of Peru to ask if they had one. And the only office in the government that had that particular kind of teleprompter was the president's office. So we asked if we could borrow it. And they said, well, in theory, yes, but the president's making a speech on that same day. And so he needs it. And so you can't. And uh, Secretary Kerry insisted on that kind of teleprompters. There are other versions that are on the floor. If you've seen a TED talk, sometimes they have the ones that are down on the floor, but he wants to look out, not down. So we started calling all of our uh, embassies um, up and down the West Coast of uh, South America, <laughs> from Ecuador and Colombia and down to Chile and Argentina to see if anybody had uh, one of these teleprompters, and they didn't. And so finally, um, we called Washington and said, could you please send uh, a technician with a teleprompter um, so that we can have it for Secretary Kerry's speech? And so we put somebody on a plane with the equipment. They arrived, set it up. Uh, they were on the ground for about eight hours and we put them on a plane and sent them back to Washington, DC. 
and we had the teleprompter. So those are some of the things that the management office gets to coordinate when there are VIP visits. Bottom right, you see then Secretary Clinton uh, and the little guy with the black hair and the big grin is my son. Um, oftentimes when we have VIPs who come to post, whether it's president, vice president, secretary, various uh, congressional delegations, et cetera, uh, particularly the, the president, vice president, and secretary, they will do what's called a meet and greet for the entire embassy community. And so people will come out um, and they'll get to meet the families and that's always a highlight of their visit. Next slide. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about the Department of State's role in the war on drugs. So when people think about the war on drugs, they often think about the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, um, which, or administration, apologies, um, which is responsible for the law enforcement side of it. So they're the ones who are going out looking for uh, the narco traffickers and uh, trying to capture the goods, et cetera, um, as they're being uh, transited through the countries for the United States. The Department of State, however, has a branch called uh, INL, the International um, Narcotics and Law Enforcement Branch. And we kind of work on the, the front end, um, trying to eradicate the drugs before they get turned into cocaine in this particular case, um, and before they get trafficked to the US. So these are pictures from Peru. Uh, this is the Amazon. And uh, you see a lot of forest, and then you'll see an opening in the forest on the top left. And that's where some farmer has come in, cut down all the trees. Um, and so the first harvest is, is the wood. A lot of it is uh, tropical hardwood, which is quite valuable. Um, and then uh, the farmer will plant cocaine. And it usually takes a year for the first crop, and then you can get three crops a year after that. It's actually the leaves from which the cocaine is extracted. Uh, and if you see the bottom left, that's actually a lab inside the forest uh, where they've piled up all the leaves and they use um, kerosene to extract the cocaine and stomp on it, kind of the way you do grapes uh, to make wine or did back in the day. Um, and that's how they extract the cocaine. And then uh, they distill it again and it becomes crystallized. And then you those bricks that you see on television, that is what it looks like. Um, and that's how they package it and then send it on its way. So these are very remote areas of the forest. Uh, there are no roads to get here. Um, the farmers or people who come in to grow the cocaine initially typically will go in uh, by um, boat. There's a, a small stream typically nearby. And these there are a lot of streams like this that all ultimately feed into the Amazon. Um, but that's how they get the goods in and out. Uh, and it's how they avoid a lot of detection as well, because these are small and covered by trees, so you can't really see them from the air. So we have helicopters that will go around and look for these fields and identify where they are. And then we bring in teams of uh, workers who you can see on the bottom right. Um, they're brought in by helicopter. They come in and they spend the day pulling up uh, the plants, the coca plants. Um, and they can't be replanted. They won't grow again if they're replanted. And so then the farmer has to start from scratch again uh, with seed. Um, typically, if we eradicate a field, it may be replanted two, maybe three times after that. Um, and then the farmer will give up and move on and open another plot. So that's what the war on drugs look like on the front end. Next slide. We also work very closely with USAID uh, in this process because we're trying to work with the farmers um, to help them grow alternative crops to coca. And uh, I will say the majority of the farmers are not trying to do something illegal. They are trying to make a buck um, to provide for their families and uh, cocaine, while it's a very dangerous business, is also lucrative. And so um, many of them get into it that way. But USAID will work with them because uh, there are two other plants that grow in the same types of conditions. And can anybody tell me on the top left what, what kind of plant that is? Again, if you put it in the chat. Yeah, it, it's used to make chocolate, but what's the plant called? Does anybody know? Cacao, very good, okay. 
So cacao is a big pod. Those pods are maybe eight to 10 inches long. Um, and you open them up inside and it's the beans, uh, the cocoa beans that are used, then they're dried and then ground up to make chocolate. So the top right, does anybody know what that plant that is? Picture on the bottom right, of course, we'll give you a hint. But yes, that's a coffee plant. And those are coffee berries, as they're called. And they look just like that. Some people say they look like holly berries. Um, and inside, again, there's a single seed that's green. If you've seen it raw, again, it gets dried and then roasted and ground. And then that's how we make coffee. But both uh, cacao and coffee will grow in similar conditions to coca to make cocaine. And so we work with farmers to transition them to these alternative crops. Um, one of the big hurdles uh, with cacao in particular is it does not produce for the first five years. And so there is a delay um, until they get their first crop. But then USAID also works with them not only to get the, the raw produce, um, but to go ahead and uh, uh, process it into either coffee or uh, chocolate, and they get a much higher um, value then for the crop. Next slide, please. John F. Kennedy said that geography has made us neighbors, history has made us friends, economics has made us partners, and necessity has made us allies. So the work of diplomacy really is working together to build relationships um, and using our best judgment to solve problems. And with that, we'll see what other questions you have. All right, there was, um, oh, there was a question earlier in the chat about um, how much interaction there is with the local community for staff. Ah, um, okay, so first of all, uh, in all of our missions overseas, we have local staff who work with us. Uh, and and they are in some ways the backbone of the embassy because while the foreign service officers will rotate every two or three years, the local staff stay on and, and are the ones with the institutional memory, et cetera. Um, depending on the size of the mission where it's located, we may have three times as many local staff as we have US. It may be more of a one-to-one -one ratio. It just depends. Um, outside of that, we typically live uh, on the local economy. And so you go to the local grocery store, your kids are in, they may be in an international school or an American school, um, but there will be local nationals who participate in that school. Many people go to local churches. Um, they travel around the countryside. So there are many, many opportunities to interact with locals. And of course, if you're in any of the, uh, if you're in the political, the economic, the public diplomacy or the consular section, you're interacting with locals all day every day outside the mission. If you're in the management um, section, that's actually where we have the largest number of local employees typically. So you're interacting with local employees, but those who work in the mission more so than those um, outside. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody asked, um, how in the world did an embassy operate before the internet and the ability to find things out immediately? <laughs> it was a little slower paced. Um, again, as I said, just 30 years ago, only 4% of Americans had passports. So imagine some of these other countries. We didn't have nearly the demand that we do now uh, for visas and for travel and for trade and for um, interactions. And things just happened at a slower pace. We sent a lot of telegrams um, and they literally went by telegram uh, and by cable. And now, of course, we send an email and it's instantaneous, but um, it was it was mostly uh, a different, a very different pace than it is now. Um, uh, we have a question. Uh, Daniel Silva talks in his books about the underground facilities under the London Embassy. Is that true? The former London Embassy or the current London Embassy? Uh, that I don't know. <laughs> um, well, I will say uh, we both buildings um, have several stories underground. 
Uh, I believe the former one had at least five stories underground. And part of that was because there was a height limitation to what you could build above ground. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of same as the Pentagon there. There are several layers underground as opposed to above ground, but. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, oh, are there any memoirs by non-political coned officers that you would recommend? Oh, there are. Actually, there's a wonderful one, Alonzo Wind, and I can't remember the exact title of it, um, but he was a USAID officer, and he um, spent a lot of time in South America, but he wrote uh, a wonderful um, memoir. There are quite a few. If you Google uh, the Foreign Service Journal, um, which is a monthly magazine put out by the Foreign Service Professional Association called AFSA, um, the American Foreign Service Association, AFSA. Uh, and once a year, they have a section in the magazine, and you can get it online. This is on the internet for anybody to, to look at. It's called In Their Own Right, W-R-I-T-E. And so they, they put a spotlight on um, books that have been written by Foreign Service personnel. And there are quite a few, some of them quite interesting. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, what was the most surprising aspect you discovered of being in service? The most surprising? That's hard. Um, you know, people often ask like, what's your favorite post or your least favorite post and that kind of thing. Everything has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, and the circumstances vary based on sort of your own personal situation. You know, when I was just married but didn't have kids, and then when I was married and, and had kids, and then when I was a, a single parent and had kids, and then my kids left, and, you know. Um, so you go through through different stages and, and are looking for different things. Um, well, I do remember the first thing that hit me when I first started working for the State Department, because I actually commented on this to, to somebody. I said, everybody's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. Um, it, there are issues, uh, you know, under stress, people can can get uh, stressed out. But, but generally speaking, um, people who are diplomats are interested in other people and uh, are curious and want to explore and want to learn. And um, so they, they tend to be very welcoming and, and warm and nice. It's kind of part of the culture. That's kind of a humanly encouraging, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, a qu question, why was the U.S. Embassy moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem? And have there been repercussions? I don't know if that's your area of expertise, but I figured I would check with you. Um, so that happened under the previous administration. And it's actually something that presidents for, I don't know, uh, several decades before had said they would do and then never did. Um, and so President Trump said, well, OK, I'm going to do it. Um, so prior to that, our embassy was in Tel Aviv. And we had what was called a Palestinian interest section. It was a consulate that was in Jerusalem that um, addressed Palestinian issues. And so uh, what they did is they continued to have the Palestinian consulate, but they moved the embassy um, itself into Jerusalem as well. So now they're both based in Jerusalem. Were there repercussions? There was a lot of hand wringing at the time. Um, but there has not been sort of, there have not been long-term repercussions, no. Thank you. Um, what percentage of career ambassadors come came up outside the political cone? Oh, I don't know. I, I don't have the exact uh, statistics on that. Um, you may be able to find it online, on the internet. I think I think we probably put that on the internet. And if we don't, then AFSA does because they track all of the uh, political or all of the ambassadors, whether they're political or career. Mm -hmm. um, they, they constantly track that. They track how many vacancies we have, et cetera. 
uh, because they uh, are also a lobbying organization. And so they'll they'll go to Congress and try to go to bat for us and <laughs> see if we can get a few more confirmations pushed through. Um, have there been any local political crisis issues when you've been stationed somewhere? Um, so I have had the great good fortune never to have been evacuated from a post. However, I was working in Washington when a number of evacuations took place. Mm. Uh, and these can happen literally overnight. Um, probably the most recent example of that was uh, Sudan. Um and we had to get people out. And so we did what's called a NEO. It's a non-combatant combatant evacuation operation where we worked very closely with the Department of Defense and uh, we have military personnel and military equipment um, that go in to then uh, evacuate people from the mission. If you think way back to um, the fall of Saigon and uh there's a an iconic photograph of a helicopter that's landing actually on the, the top of the DCM's, the Deputy Chief of Mission residence, and people are being put into the helicopter and then flown off um, to a, a U.S. military um, battleship, an aircraft carrier, uh, which is where they were first taken and then from there um, transferred back to the United States. But so those things do happen. It's rare. It's very rare. Uh, we do evacuate people for a variety of different reasons, and it may be security. Um, recently, Haiti was evacuated. That's been in the news. You may have seen that. We encourage all U.S. citizens to, to leave as well. There is a very important principle um, that's been put in place since the 1998, I believe it was, a uh, bombing of, of Pan Am, whatever flight number it was, over Lockerbie, Scotland, um, which is basically the no double standard rule. So if we are evacuating diplomatic personnel, then we have to notify Americans in country that we are doing that. And we then provide assistance. Again, we don't put them on the plane and we don't pay for their flight, um, but we will facilitate travel. And sometimes that involves things like chartering planes, uh, commercial planes. And so we reach out to the airlines and, and we have a link with you know, various U.S. carriers, and we will ask them to come in. Um, the evacuation in Lebanon, we actually used cruise ships. So uh, there are lots of different ways it can occur when when things go south. Thank you. I just realized you probably, I've been nodding as you're talking and my face, yeah, I can't see, but come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, let's see. So we have just a few minutes left. Um, there's some other questions that are sort of related to, you know, like, can you request to stay in a place and um, rather than moving and do people keep um, a place in the US or do they just, you know, pick up everything, that, those kinds of things. I figured I'd let you decide if you wanna cover any of those. And then- sure. No, yeah. happy to talk about it because it really is, you know, it's a career where the whole family participates. Um, and and you have to be very clear about that when you go into it. Uh, if you have a, a dual career couple, one working for the State Department and one not, um, but who doesn't have a portable career, it can be very difficult. Um, and so we are seeing actually more and more tandem couples uh, because it, it makes it easier for the family to stay together and for people to have, have two careers. Um, but there are a lot of considerations I mentioned a couple of times with kids, with schools, there may be special needs, um, there may be medical issues, et cetera. I was a tandem. I was well, half of an interagency tandem. My ex-husband was with USAID. And so we did a couple of tours uh, together in Nigeria and Colombia. Um, and uh, then separated. But um, do you have a home or home base in the US? A lot of people do, some don't. It depends, again, kind of when you join. Uh, historically, people usually join straight out of college or graduate school. It, it's very much a career. You grow up in the department and you move up and you have lots of different experiences. Being in a small mission in a small country is gonna be very different than being in a large mission in, in another country um, on another continent. And so you know, understanding some of those differences and being able to operate in those environments is very important. Um, 
but the younger people may not have had, you know, a house or a home base before they joined. Nowadays, the average age of people joining is 34. Hmm. So they may have had a 10 year career before they joined and, and they may have been established somewhere. So they may have a home. Um, sometimes people buy homes in the DC area just because when you're not overseas, typically you come back and do a tour in Washington and there are lots of different offices in DC you can work in. Um, some people like to spend most of their career overseas and save up their money and then buy a nice retirement place when they come back and figure out where they want to do. Some people retire overseas. So lots of options. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, um, thank you so much for, for all of your time tonight and for walking us through all of this. Um, any last things you want to share about this work or your experience uh, with the Department of State? Um, I, well, I don't know the, the relative age of most people on the call, but if you know of people in your family or friends or yourselves, if you're interested, I would really encourage you to, um, to preserve it as a, a possible career. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating. I think it was tremendous for my kids to live in different countries overseas. I think it gives you a very different perspective, not only on the other countries, but kind of on your own country as well. Um, and so. Great. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much for the opportunity. Great. Thank you all for being here tonight. And uh, this will be recorded. So you're welcome to share it out with uh, any folks in your life who might be interested in learning more. Great. Great. Thank you. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Okay.